Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome back to this afternoon session. Our focus today is on Bell Hooks. We have had a wonderful day and a half um, celebrating the lives and legacies of Lonnie Bonaire and Bell Hooks. But today is Bell's Day. And I'm really excited to introduce our panel um, this um, afternoon. Um, our moderator for this afternoon is Dr. Nolaway Rooks, and an interdisciplinary scholar. Nolaway is the chair and a faculty member in Africana Studies here at Brown University, and the founding director of the Severonomics Lab um, at the school. Her work explores how race and gender um, um, both impact and are impacted by popular culture, um, social history, and political life in the United States. She works on the cultural and racial implications of beauty, fashion, adornment, race, capitalism, and education, and the urban politics of food, cannabis, production. The author of four books and numerous articles, essays, and op-eds, <coughs> Brooks has received research funding from the Ford Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, and the Woodrow Wilson School, among others. She lectures frequently uh, at colleges and universities across the country and is a regular contributor um, to popular outlets such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Chronicle of Higher Education, Time Magazine, NPR, and look for her to contribute to some other things, but I digress, I won't go with that. <laughs> Rook's current book is in which she um, coined the term segregonomics, is cutting school um, is cutting school, privatization, segregation, and the end of public education, which won an award for nonfiction from the Hurston Wright Foundation. Her current research, for which she has received a Kaplan Fellowship and um, a fellowship from the Atkinson School, the Atkinson Center for Sustainable Future, will explore relationships between capitalism, land, urban food, politics, capitalism, um, legalization, and the, in the United States. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Noway Brooks to the stage. <laughs> Joining Dr. Brooks is um, Dr. Bache Richardson. Dr. Richardson is a professor of African American Literature and Africana Studies and Research Center at Cornell University. Her interviews have been highlighted in news media such as the NBC, um, the Today Show, Nightly News, CNN, Al Jazeera's News Hour, and the New York Times. Her op-eds have appeared in the New York Times, Public Books, and the Huff Post. She has produced over 40 essays and have been published in journals as American Literature, Mississippi Quarterly, the Forum for Modern Language Studies, um, Black Renaissance, Renaissance Noir, Trans um, Atlantic, just to name a few. Um, she was highlighted um, by Choice Book among the outstanding academic titles of 2008, her book, Black Masculinity in the U.S. South, From Uncle Tom to Gangster. Love that title. <laughs> and her recent book, Emancipation's Daughters, Reimagining Black Femininity and the Natural, National Body, was released by Duke University Press in 2020. Since 2018, she has served as the editor of the new Southern Studies book series in the University of Georgia Press, and was co-editor um, from its inception in um, 05. Um, um, Dr. Richardson is also a visual <coughs> artist. Please welcome Dr. Richardson to the stage. <laughs> Joining us virtually is Rebecca Walter. Rebecca is a best-selling create, um, creative, consultant, and cultural catalyst who has contributed to the global conversation about race, gender, sexuality, um, power for over two decades. Her books include Black, White, and Jewish, Autobiography for the, a Shifting Self, Body Love, Choosing Motherhood After a Lifetime of Ambivalence, Black Cool, uh, 1,000 Streams of Blackness, The Interactive Journal, What's Your Story? A Guide to Everyday Evolution and Women Talk, Money, Breaking the Taboo. She has written, developed, and produced film and television products, um, projects with um, Warner Brothers, NBC, Universal, Amazon, HBO, and Paramount. Spoken at over 400 universities and corporate campuses, including Harvard, the Whitney Museum, the TEDx, um, the Lawn and Services, as a, and serves as a DEI consultant 
several uh, Fortune 500 companies. When Rebecca was 21, she co-founded the Third Wave Fund, which makes grants to women and transgender youth working for social justice. She has won many awards, including the Woman Who Could Be President Award from the League of Women Voters, and was named by Time Magazine as one of the most influential leaders of her generation. Ladies and gentlemen, joining us virtually is Rebecca Walters. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, <laughs> is Dr. DeMarcus Hill, um, who is a poet and creative scholar. She is the author of Breath um, Better Spent, Living Black Girlhood, A Bound Woman is a Dangerous Thing, The Incarceration of African American Women from Harriet Tubman to Sandra Bland, The Fluid Boundaries of Suffrage and Jim Crow, Stalking Claims in the American Heartland, and other works. Her digital works include Shut Up in My Bones, a 21st century poem. Similar to her creative process, Hill scholarly research is interdisciplinary, and she's a professor of English and creative writing in Africana, African American studies at the University of Kentucky. And um, Dr. Hill spent the fall semester here as a fellow in the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity at Brown University. Please welcome Dr. Hill to the stage. Hey everybody, how you doing? Good. You alright? Yeah. Matthew, can you take a picture of us for a minute? And send it to me? Thank you. <laughs> so, our panel is to really kind of situate and talk about Gloria Watkins Bell Hooks from a personal as well as an intellectual perspective. Some of us have had uh, real relationships with her. Um, some of us teach much of her work. Um, we understand her light, her genius, and her complexities in a multitude of ways. Um, and we are here to just sort of begin to explore some, just to open things up. Um, I'm going to ask, and we'll start with Rebecca, then Daenerys, and then Rache for this. Just talk, talk to us about who Gloria was to you when you came to know her and mostly what you want the audience both here and online to know about her, what you're most interested in people taking away what you think about the work. So we'll start with Rebecca. Oh, oh, no sound, no sound. No sound. Jake, is there a meeting? Oh, there Hi, everyone. Hi. How is that? Can yes. you hear me? Yes. <clears throat> I'm so happy to be here with all of you. Thank you so much for, for having me. Um, I'm recovering from COVID, so I, I brought some notes <clears throat> because, you know, this thing is a little bit hard on the mind. Um, but <clears throat> I think I can, can just jump right in um, and say, you know, I studied with Belle at Yale when I was an undergraduate. She was a visiting professor. And we were all, as women of color, as people of color, as students who were starved for, for food, for intellectual food, for psycho, spiritual, emotional solace, for um, inspiration, for enlightenment. We were starving at that time. This was the early 90s. And I, I came into Bell's orbit as, as a young seeker. And she was an exemplary um, teacher and guide in almost every way. So when I think about Belle and when I think about what I, what I would like people to know about her, her lived, the, the lived experience of Belle, um, is that she lived as herself completely. She lived um, with passion, with depth, with glamour, with rigor, with critical insight. Um, she was funny. She was always laughing. She was always making jokes. Um, she had us, you know, just, she, she had a, a buoyancy of spirit, you know, that, that kept us going. Um, she believed in the power of black women. She believed in the power of the sacred community. Um, she also believed in stirring the pot of that community because she felt that, you know, it, it needed um, a constant revisioning and energizing. And that was part of her gift, was to just be completely fearless in asking questions and pushing us further. Um, I remember her as being incredibly disciplined, 
almost monastic. She brought rigor in a way that I have never experienced anyone bringing rigor. Um, I remember the, a little small thing I thought of as I was waiting to come on. She also wrote in the tiniest script, and, and anyone who, who's seen her writing knows this, and it was as if, <clears throat> after knowing her incredible, prodigious, prolific output, it was almost as if she was concerned that there would never be enough space, never enough pages, you know, to, to fill the multitude of her, of her voice and her thoughts and her ideas. Um, so that's, that's the beginning um, of what I would say that I would like people to, to kind of feel about Belle. Um, I, I first met Belle probably in the pages of her work. I first met Belle probably in the pages of her work um, and was privileged enough later to apply some of the theories um, from teaching to transgress into my pedagogical model. Um, and then fortunately enough when I started working in Kentucky, we were able to build a relationship and likewise to what Rebecca is talking about, I found her to be funny, joyful. Her home, um, for me, was the most welcoming and safest space in Kentucky. Um, and she was able to teach me how to strategize and capitalize and turn rage into a type of, of power that was useful and specific to that space. Like Damaris, I first encountered Bell Hooks in her writing. I was introduced to her at age 18 through the Spelman College freshman reading list, which included uh, multiple selections, um, among them, Ain't I a Woman. And then, within the next two years, I read her more casually on my own essay collections, like talking back and yearning. And I saw her speak for the first time at Woodruff Library in Atlanta, where that day she was putting the heat on John Singleton's film, Ooh. Boys in the Hood. A film about which a lot of us were feeling very sentimental at the time. I thought that I was a pretty good cultural critic, but apparently not good enough. And she, um, in that moment, I think, encapsulated that um, courageous spirit that said what needed to be said. And, and so I really appreciated um, her candor. Um, and it urged us to think about the film in new ways. And so that was interesting. And then I encountered her soon after that, more formally, once I became a minor in women's studies, working with uh, Dr. Beverly Guy Sheptal and as a senior at Spelman, and, and we uh, read her book, Black Looks. I feel that actually taking courses with Dr. Guy Sheptal and Dr. Wade Gales was one of the main things that prepared me uh, for graduate school and actually reading Bell Hooks because she introduced a lot of the critical concepts that I eventually encountered in my graduate career and so really helped with that transition. In graduate school, I tended to relate to her because I was inspired by her pedagogy and also um, works such as Art on My Mind. It's that book actually more than anything else that encouraged me to begin to collect Southern folk art. You know, she helped me to understand that art was available, that art was accessible, even for, say, uh, beginning assistant professors. And so her example made all the difference for me. And my own collection would have been inconceivable and impossible without the example of Bell Hooks. For years, I tended to think of her and read her in a more private way and savor the personal impact that she made on me in terms of my path as a scholar, um, initially in the University of California, eventually at Cornell. At Cornell was where I began to realize that um, it would be valuable and important to teach her full body of, of, of works more comprehensively in much the same way that I approached the work of a Nobel laureate, uh, Toni Morrison, and a happy birthday to Toni Morrison today. But um, 
I introduced the Bell Hooks Books course in 2013 and it got a wonderful reception, including a lot of support from my former colleague, uh, Elie Roy Brooks. Thank you again so much for that. And more recently, I taught it this past fall as a tribute to her. And what was exciting about that moment was that there were 25 undergraduates who enthusiastically embraced it. Some of them had you know, been introduced to Bell Hooks before. Some of them didn't know anything about her and were just curious to learn. And so one thing that I knew was that I had to somehow get them in a, in a room with Dr. Beverly Guy Sheptal. And I was so thankful that she visited our class. It was just more than I could have ever, ever hoped for and a deep inspiration. And the students were very excited to um, hear what um, Beverly had to say. So um, in terms of her impact, what I think I, I want people to know that has been special to me about Bell Hooks is that she's definitely, um, from where I stand, a premier and model black Southern woman intellectual and just a, 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 an esteemed and superior and model intellectual in general. And then I also appreciate her profound cultural impact. So I wasn't actually supposed to talk, but anybody who knows me knows that that's a whatever kind of proposition. So over, Can we just add oh sure, one, go one, ahead. One. Yeah, Rebecca, sure, sure. Yeah, I wanted to just add because of the eloquence of, of the two of you who have just spoken, I want to add a little bit about what she was able to give me as a writer. Mm -hmm. um, I think that she, <clears throat> if she hadn't written Wounds of Passion, I would never have written my first memoir. Um, black, white, and Jewish. I, I think that, that what she was able to give to those of us who did not want to follow an academic path, who did not want to get our PhDs, who did not want to be um, what we experienced as bound by the academic um, expectation and, and paradigm, um, I think she, she really told us your genius, your intelligence, your creativity is just as valuable and even if you have to, um, you know, give, give yourself the 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 um, the PhD, you know, give yourself the letters, give yourself the affirmation. You can do that because this this kind of of reverence and respect is is your birthright to have, and you don't need to get it from an institution. And that was a great gift, you know, to those of us who who found ourselves more on the artist uh, journey, on the seeker's journey, and, and couldn't really do the work that, that the three of you on stage are doing, which is to really you know, be able to soldier on in, in, a, in an environment that often I experience as extremely hostile to black women and to our creativity and voice. And, and without her model, I think it would have been extremely difficult for me to do the work that I do. So I just wanted to, I was over lunch just talking about the first time I actually met um, Bell Hooks. And I can't remember if I had engaged her work at that point. Um, but I, I was at Spellman and Beverly was having some kind of event in the Women's Center. Um, and this group called Sweet Honey and the Rock was going to be playing in Atlanta. And, and much to, I'm like, I'm embarrassed now, but I never heard of Sweet Honey and the Rock. Before. So, so people were like, Sweet Honey and the Rock is coming, and Bernice Johnson Reagan is our Spellman sister. And you know, like, we, we're, we're all, everybody was really excited. I'm kind of like, and he's like, I don't know. But, um, <laughs> but at the, at the uh, kind of gathering that we were having, I, I, you know, was running around kind of going, I don't know. I don't know who this is, but I don't have any money. In any case, I'd like to go. So I just started randomly asking people in the room for money. <laughs> now, I will tell you, uh, Beverly was a little horrified at this, <laughs> low level, <laughs> she was, or, or stunned. She was like, you are literally like running around asking these random people for money. Like, what are you thinking? But Gloria Bell uh, pulled out $10 and handed it to me. And it got the flow starting. So other people, you know, got over Beverly's, like, <laughs> what is going on with her? <laughs> and started going in their pocket. And that's the first time that I got to see it. So it's a generosity of spirit that I appreciated. Um, uh, and I will always, honestly, just remember, started. Of course, I had a different kind of respect for her 
going forward as I engage more with her work. Um, in talking, oh, go ahead. I, I just wanted to add a little bit to what Rebecca said. I, I love that um, one of the gifts that, that Bell Hooks gave us is that I think prior to her entrance in the academy in terms of intellectualism, there was definitely this double helix and this pairing of elitism uh, co-opting intellectualism. And she made it a point to disrupt that. And in disrupting that, she made a lot of space for creative scholars, artists, and for those of us that were pursuing intellectual lives and thinking, but did not want to be bound by the paradigms that already existed, and knew that those paradigms did not account for our lives and the ways that we wanted to appropriate knowledge. And I think if that that happened with Bell Hooks, is how I, I interpret that. And yeah. <laughs> one thing that I will um, also add is that I think a quality that I found to be intensely captivating about her among so many was her willingness to discuss herself, her life, and to draw on her life experiences. Within feminism, we hear that um, mantra, the personal is political. And I think that she embodied that ethos um, quite compellingly, always, and consistently. And so her work was very um, inspiring and I think provocative, always and revealing at the level that she discussed the personal and owned um, her relationship to her history and past and used it, I think, to enrich and impact so many lives. And then eventually um, seeing her memoir, reading her memoir, um, Bone Black was also a wonderful experience. And it, it pulled together and synthesized so many parts of her story that we had encountered in other places. So when we think of a kind of um, ultimate uh, serial um, writer or biographer, uh, the esteemed Dr. Maya Angelou comes to mind. But at a different level, I, I really value Bell Hooks for having consistently and in a serialized form shared her autobiography. Picking up on that, um, also over lunch, we were talking a little bit about how geography matters in Bell Hooks' is, is world. Uh, how she talks about her family, she locates herself in the South. Um, very often she returned to the South. I wonder if you could just very briefly kind of think about her um, in terms of geography, in terms of the South, in terms of how place um, really mattered and shaped who she was, the genius, the core of that genius was nurtured in black communities and black households um, in, in Appalachia, in the South that sometimes we don't always claim as a black South. Exactly. So I was speaking American then, but you're saying then Rebecca. I, I live in Kentucky now, and Kentucky is, is kind of wedged in between the Midwest, the upper delta, what I'm calling the upper delta, and then the Plains region. Um, and it wasn't until I visited Hopkinsville mm -hmm. that I got to better understand Bone Black and, 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 and Bell Hooks, Gloria Watkins in a much more um, tangible way. Not growing up in that central location, but understanding the cultural and political complexity of that space produces resilient black girl genius. It's not appropriate, but we cannot deny the genius of Brown alumni, um, Gail Jones. We can't deny the genius of ZZ Packer. We can't deny the, the genius of Crystal Wilkinson and the highly intellectual genius of Bell Hooks, all coming from that, that college in space and, and that, that um, specific type of conflation of power, racism, agricultural culture, agricultural culture, and, and, and the specific history that black women have in that place in terms of slavery, of it being a state where 
much of the breeding was happening and the production of, of slaves to be um, shipped out to other spaces along the Mississippi and in the Midwest. I don't know if that made any sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what y'all think? Since you want more? You need explanation? You good? Yeah? Yeah, that was beautiful. <laughs> yeah, Kentucky produces those really brilliant women that are writers and that are inclined to always reshape the boundaries that are put in front of them and in a generous way that allow us to envision better futures. And as we were talking about earlier, this type of prophetic envisioning, this prophetic imagination of the future. They do that. I think that my critical work on what it means to be a black southerner and the value of uh, drawing on geography, analytically speaking, and uh, thinking through aspects of U.S. culture uh, goes back to my years as, at Spelman as an undergraduate um, in that although everyone, almost everyone, because Spelman, you know, always had exchange students, but um, all of us were black, all of us were women, and so we knew that other different constituting categories had room to come front and center. And it's within that context that I noticed uh, the emphasis on the urban in shaping so many aspects of uh, social life and concomitantly a devaluation of aspects of black Southern identity. And so those were dynamics that I noticed in a more casual sense as an undergraduate, but by my graduate years began to think of the implications of those dynamics from a much more um, critical and philosophical uh, foundation and reading works like Bell Hooks's Wounds of Passion, describing uh, what it meant to migrate from the South and Kentucky westward to attend school at Stanford and encountering a lot of stereotypes and ideologies about uh, Southern identity was a very instructive thing for me and it affirmed some of what I had observed myself about the, the problematic of the, um, the, the, the problem with such uh, cultural politics. And so I value the ways in which she foregrounded her background as um, a woman who um, has origins in the US South and then drew on it for critical thinking and it's very much what I've tried to do in so many aspects of my own intellectual work and art. Yeah, I haven't spoken very much on this subject, but <clears throat> it strikes me that um, I did a lot of my undergraduate work on um, what I was calling Ben Shack aesthetic, which is really a study of the built environment of black people in the South and linking that the ways in which we encode our environments and our spaces um, with different ideas from West African cosmology. And I was obviously working with Sylvia Arden Boone, uh, Robert Ferris Thompson when I was at Yale, and, and those were, were some of my mentors in that space. And when I think about the ways in which the South informed Bell's practice and, and my experience of her, I think about her built environment. I think about her home place. And I think about the way in which it resonated with me as a daughter of the South as well, the daughter of a mother of deeply of the South, who, who always created spaces um, in our home that were, I would say in many ways, anti-capitalist, um, that were of the earth, that were pro-beauty, that were all about creating a space for the ancestral spirits to dwell and a space for the living and the present to commune. Um, they were spaces full of art, of, of a transcendent spiritual um, 
energy. And, and Bell was very much a part of that geomancy. When I experienced her, her environment, there was, a, there was a homecoming for me. There was a recognition of the empty chair that is left for the, the stranger or the spirit. There is a sense of the images of the ancestral past so that we are connecting with the past, the present, and the future. There is a use of color that is dynamic. There are no straight lines. There's the zig, there's the zag, there's the openness or anything to happen. Um, and there's not a lot of, um, not a lot of stuff from Walmart, not a lot of plastic, not a lot, you know, there's wood, there, there, there are real materials. Um, and there's a relationship to the earth around, all around, right? The sky, the light, the ground, the, you know. And, and to me, that's very much out of the Southern tradition. Um, and so that is, is where I, I really find words to express that relationship. And I think so much of, of her work and being um, emerged from from the space that she built and that was shaped by all of these different forces and, and stories and voices that she grew up with. So I'm wondering if we can uh, talk a little bit about the space that she opened up for black women or black scholars um, to really claim the title intellectual unproblematically. Um, it's a it's a fraught term, you know. Like some some in our communities push back against the idea of women claiming that title of intellectual, of black people claiming the title of intellectual. And, and at her core, for me, she was. Um, but if y'all could just kind of talk a little bit about that. The, the complications of that space when you want to step into it um, and say, this is who I am and how she helps us think about it. We'll start with Rache and go back to it. So Rache can marry us with that. Well, about um, Bell Hooks, I've always loved and admired her self-awareness about what she likes and her passionate approaches to doing her work and being deeply committed to those processes. Um, I, I really have admired that she discussed her sense of process and it, I think, was the kind of thing that helped me to understand that not all aspects of one's process had to be perfect. Uh, embodied perfectly, but that it was a practice and an ongoing um, challenge in some ways, but that we were charged to, you know, um, persist. And so that's one thing that I think has stuck with me. Spolin was an institution, um, by the time I was there, very premised on notions of black women's empowerment. And um, by the time that I was a senior and at age, of, age 21, I was an emerging artist and also bound for graduate school at Duke. And it was at that juncture that I began to conceptualize my goals as being um, to become a writer, artist, and activist, whatever that meant. And I wasn't entirely um, sure you know about what that entailed but that was the bar that was set from the very beginning and going out into the world and like many um i think that there there's been a sense um that we we witnessed of what it means to be an intellectual being very um, male-centered and even identified primarily with masculinity um, as someone myself who uh, attended all black Catholic schools from first grade and who was a student leader by my junior and senior years as student council vice president then president at the historic St. Jude Educational Institute in Montgomery, Alabama, best historically known as the final camping space for someone to Montgomery Marchers in 1965, I didn't really 
feel that sense of otherness or um, how can I say it? I mean, I, I made better grades than a lot of the boys and also I was a prominent student leader and so I, 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 I was always very really confident about my intellectual abilities and so I think that once I did go to college and um, once I had exposure to just so many phenomenal black women at Spelman en masse, the bar was high and it was an experience that authorized me to indeed pursue my goals and dreams. And reading scholars like Bell Hooks definitely added to that, and she was um, charting a very unique path as a professional, and that was also intensely public. And, and so all of um, what I witnessed, I think, during that formative period really inspired me tremendously. I think my, I, I thank you for that story. Um, you made me think about, I think my formative process was somewhat delayed by, by parenting, but in between the time of me earning my undergraduate degree at Morgan State University and the master's degree, and then returning for my PhD, I was looking for, for people like Val Hooks to teach me how not to live my life in precious categories, but to live as a whole person. And that mm. did not exist for me before I started really looking to bell hooks about how to have this intellectual life that wasn't policed or regulated exclusively by theories that dictated the canon or that came before me. And how do I become an intellectual demerit and administrative demerits and a writer demerits that also happens to be a mother, and Belle did her fair share of othering mothering, right? And so mm -hmm. looking towards um, her life as an example, living and writing transparently and with everything, with everything, being unashamed, bringing your grief to the page, bringing your victories to the page, thinking about your traumas and grief as springboards into a new intellectual dimension. So I, I think the word intellectual is almost too small to describe the way that she shifted that paradigm from being a linear one to being a dynamic one. Mm. Yeah. Preach. <laughs> intellectual uh, family, and, and when I went off to college, I, I pretty much thought I knew a lot of things. I, I was not afraid to think of myself as an intellectual. I was a thinker. I was, I was, you know, I was standing up in every class, you know, calling teachers to the mat, calling my classmates to the mat, you know, and, and I, was, I was fully, you know, comfortable in that space, and I'm very grateful that I was raised to be that way. Um, but Belle took it to another level for me. Um, Belle said, you know, okay, you know, you can think, but what's the thought underneath the thought? You know, what are you really thinking? <laughs> what are you really saying? What are you really centering? Who are you really serving? Who is the master? What is going on, you know, even with your sense of centering yourself? How is it that you are able to be centered in your community at any moment? What does that mean? Um, and so she, she really pushed me to understand that, that being a, a true intellectual, a true thinker, was a, a many layered, a many, a many, uh, you know, a, a, a multitude of experiences. And because I was able to be with her in so many different spaces and to talk about so many different things, I came to understand that you never left your intellect outside. You know, your intellect, your mind, the way in which you were assessing situations, it was in the bedroom. It was at the kitchen table. It was walking down the street. 
It was watching every single thing you watched and thought about. It, it was it permeated. You know, it, it was it was not just designed for the intellectual conversation, right? It was it was about bringing a level of acuity and self awareness and determination and activism and commitment to transforming thought and the world around you to every moment of your life. And that was a different level of being an intellectual. <laughs> you know, that was like, okay. And, and it's exactly as, as you just said, it's, it's the, the word intellectual seems far too small. You know, this was, this was a, a new level that, that crashed through ideas of intellect and was about the, the bleeding, the sharing, the oozing, the emanation of a genius that is our birthright. And she gave us that permission. She showed us that birthright. And, and that, uh, you know, the, there are no words to describe for me the importance of, of that gift. How did you come up with the word? Not right now. <laughs> I, I know like we it's could. Too small to contain the hooks. What, what could we crack? I'm not asking on this right now, but you think about it where you find the thoughts. What could we crack that? does justice to the complexity um, of what she brought to us. So I, I, I think of Bell Hooks as having been irreverently black in a way, um, and expressively complicated. Um, and I'm wondering if y'all can talk a little bit, both if, if, if you want to talk about how it shows up in your own, the consequences of irreverence and complication, um, self, in our, how, how that shows up for us individually, or how you saw it impacting how Gloria Bellhooks moved through the world. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, so let's do Damaris, Rebecca, Rache. Mixing <laughs> stuff up. <laughs> Mixing stuff up, yes. Um, so, when we think about the history of the space we call America, mm -hmm. the whole purpose of the inter, you know, the intersections of identity that would make you black woman and associate you with class were were exploitation on multiple levels for your intellect, for your body, for your children, so on and so forth. And so when I think about Bell unapologetically bringing this culture into the higher education industrial complex, that's the concept <laughs> like that, right? Um, and just her presence, even before she demonstrated her genius plus or demonstrated her intellectual capabilities, just her presence in that space was enough to destabilize and begin to rattle and tremor the higher educational space. Because black women are supposed to be accessible and commodified in a way that she was not accessible and commodified. And I think it brought more to that unapologetically black had a lot to do with her being unapologetically free in a black woman in a kind of intellectual, blues woman, existentialist, unbound kind of way, that she was okay with her, her mouth representing sapphire, right? She was okay with being impolite. She was okay with being viewed as, as rude or disruptive and, and accepted the consequences of her liberated choice. And, um, and I think that she talked about a few of them. You know, some of them might, been, might have been her sanity at certain times. <laughs> you know, how she felt personally about her sanity. But whenever you dislocate yourself from the social contract that has been constructed for, for you in this place called America or any other place, but particularly here, you will be disciplined until you find yourself back in that role. And if you choose never to be there, you'll continue to be disciplined. Mm -hmm. Rebecca. 
Yes. I think you should just, are you proud of all this? <laughs> because I love your voice. <laughs> Um, and everything that you're saying, I, I would I would add to that. You know, when I was at school with Belle, <clears throat> we all prayed that she would be offered a position. And and you know, at that time, I think we were talking about maybe three, four, maybe five at the most black people with tenure at Yale. Um, and yet, to us, it was like, well, of course, you know, she. <laughs> who else could possibly um, be as worthy? And you know, at a certain point, it became clear that that was not going to happen. And I think we all, or I did, you know, in, in the conversations that we had and also my assessment of the university, it became clear that she was not going to be offered that path because she was, as we've all said, unapologetic. She was herself. She was fierce. She was challenging. She was not going to be silenced. She was not going to be shamed. She was not fit into this 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 space of the of the sort of docile giving accommodating all the different things that we that we know black women are supposed to do she was not going to be grateful that that she had been giving this she was going to understand that she deserved the position and more and that in itself was the the thing that kept her from from getting it um and i think <clears throat> when i think about the ways in which we're disciplined I think about the fact, you know, Bell did not get a MacArthur Genius Grant, you know. Bell did not get a multi-million dollar book deal. Bell did not get an endowed professorship at an Ivy League institution. And these are the ways in which, um, you know, we could say she paid the price for her, her liberation. She paid the price. And that's the price so many of us pay when we do, you know, to use, you know, an old, an old, way of speaking about when we speak truth to power, when we stand as who we are, when we resist the, the limitations that are put on us that tell us to be quiet, that tell us to be smaller, that tell us not to think critically, not to think in ways that dismantle this system. Um, when we refuse to do that, we are not rewarded. And so we, we have to find other spaces of reward and other spaces of self-reclamation and honoring. And I, I think that, for me, um, the way in which she drew her power at the end of all of that, when, when it became very clear that that's what was happening, um, what you turn to, and what she turned to, and what I turned to, is your readers. Your, the people are the ones that count. You, know? you start to realize that you, you have to, as always, put your faith in, in the medicine you're bringing and in the love that you get from those who are taking your medicine and who are gonna love you and, and honor you. And as we are doing right now, speak your name after your death and, and, for, and forever, you know? And that's where you find the strength and the power. And that's where the rewards lie in the community, you know? And I think that Belle really, whether she understood that at the beginning or whether she came to understand it like so many of us come to understand it, um, she managed to, to embrace it and transform it into a real model of, of being. Sacramento every day to catch 
catch my bus for many years. And that and I love you were always what she said in her phone calls from Alabama to me every morning. In, a, in an academic context, I valued uh, Bell Hooks' model in terms of what it means to talk back mm -hmm. and to own one's voice, to do what another one of my professors says, um, Gloria Wade Gales, claim your space. Mm -hmm. You know, what does that mean? And even within the institution, you know, to have that boldness to indeed claim one's space and operate under the premise that I do indeed belong here. Because so often we are treated as guests. I remember even when I first arrived at Duke, some of the graduate students would say things like, oh, it's, it's good you're here. You know, but there's that implication that somehow the person of color is the guest within the institution. And so what does it mean to have a sense of our own belonging in these institutions and to be very acutely aware of what we bring that without our contributions, these institutions are diminished. And then I think that there was that quality about Bell Hooks that um, we saw where she, again, took the tough positions. And in, in so many instances, the ability to do so took courage, what it means to speak up. During the time when um, Obama was on the campaign trail, I remember uh, in my former English department, um, or my, my former department at um, University of California, Davis, another scholar and I would have these whispered conversations, usually in the doorway of her, of her office or mine, about the progress that Obama was making. And in retrospect, I have to ask myself, why on earth are we whispering? You know, <laughs> this is a liberal department purportedly, and yet and still there was a sense that certain conversations had to be kept on the quiet. I think an age of social media has helped me to become far more comfortable in my own skin in the academy and to increasingly claim and own my voice. And I could never in many years go back to that walking on eggshells feeling that I had, you know, I think in a context like that, um, keeping the stiff upper lip or, you know, just really not necessarily being too noisy about certain issues. I think that it's okay actually to make noise. And Bell Hooks was one of those people, I think, who helped pave the way, you know, to more freedom and more of a sense of voice for so many scholars and intellectuals all around. Um, she definitely is that type of person who helped me to understand and recognize that I could simultaneously claim my interests in writing and art, that those interests were not necessarily mutually exclusive or should not be kept in separate spheres. And so that's something that I've um, valued from her, you know, from Shirley Chisholm, that idea of what it means to be truly unbought and unbossed is an ethos that I think that Bell Hooks um, quintessentially embody that we should never be defined or confined by institutions. I think listening to um, Dr. Richardson, I was just thinking about James Baldwin's quote that um, for, for, white, for white people, Education is indoctrination for black people. Education is assimilation. And just thinking about all the ways that Bell resisted that in, in every aspect of her academic career. Mm. I think uh, just kind of bouncing off of what you just said, um, Vanessa, I guess you could call you all Professor Bell, <laughs> Professor Richardson. <laughs> Um, you, we're, we're in a particular moment right, right now. The, the country's going through some things. Like, the country's always going through some things, but those things are um, falling disproportionately on queer folks, black folks, um, right now, in terms of making clear what and who is accepted, what kinds of writers. Um, Phillips was just kicked out of the AP curriculum that's supposed to be African-American studies, right? And there are a lot of the 
us that are like, there, there just simply is no African American studies without bell hooks. There's simply no analysis of women's studies without bell hooks. There's no analysis of, of media, um, of black love, that doesn't include bell hooks for a lot of us. But in this moment, we're watching a pretty frontal assault that I feel like she's prepared us for in some way. Right, I mean, those of us who, who knew her, who read her, who lift her up, um, she, she, we should be soldiers in some kind of army. <laughs> or she gave us some insights and some moments and some thinking to prepare us for what we're facing. What do y'all think, and I didn't tell you guys why I asked you this, but um, what do y'all think, what is, what is it she would urge us to do in this moment around these issues? Um, what did she leave us that we're willing to embrace? You, you would do Rebecca Damaris and then Rochelle. Well, I think she left us everything that we've talked about, which is you know, <clears throat> you know, inhabit yourself and your space and your life in your fullness, and do not allow anyone to to amputate and, and do not amputate any parts of yourself, and and muster all you have and, and all you have been given to to speak up and, and to make sure that your, your voice is heard and that you feel comfortable in any room that you find yourself and that you never allow anyone to take your your dignity, your your sense of belonging, your sense of um, of righteousness um, and, and, and of, of fierceness. Don't, don't ever don't ever stand back from that. And, and I would also say, you know, and I find myself talking to students about this a lot, I do not think that Bell um, would be supportive of a lot of language in the classroom necessarily <clears throat> about not feeling safe in difficult conversations. And that is not to say that, that all of these academic environments that we know are often unsafe psycho-spiritually in, in other ways, um, it's not to say that they are safe spaces, but it is to say that, that, that the women who came before us and the women who are surrounding all of us, we, we are not doing our work so that young women um, and men and non-binary folks can, can be in classrooms and feel that they cannot speak in their true voices and have meaningful, you know, confrontational, if necessary, conversations with their classmates and with their professors. And I, I'm, I, I think about this stance of, 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 sort, of a, a sort of an extreme vulnerability that is being embraced as a, as a kind of narrative of empowerment. And I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure where Bell would stand on that. I mean, you know, I, I remember being in an African lit class and, you know, Cyprina Quincy was there talking about you know, how I shouldn't be asking my questions. If I were in his country, I would be killed. Was I a lesbian? How dare I question the fact that all of the black women in his books died? And my professor, Michael Cook, did not say anything in my defense, you know, but I persisted. You know, it was, it did not feel safe at all. And yet I was um, determined to, to bring the voices of all of those black women who had been murdered in his books and in his world and in his life and in his, in our lives to the table, and, and, and I was not going to be silenced, and my, my sense of retribution, that my grades would suffer, that my fellow students would think of, I, that did not stop me. And it did not stop me when I stood up in a, in a lecture hall full of 300 people in front of the most preeminent art historian teaching the history of art and said, this class should be called the history of white Western male art, period. And the entire, the entire room was quiet, and he told me to sit down and be quiet, and I left that room. She did not teach us not to do that. And that is what I want young people to be doing in this moment, um, to, to move away from a stance of um, a, a sort of um, sense of, 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 oh, this is, this, is, this, is too, this is too much. And this is what it is, and it's going to always be this way. It has been this way. It is going to continue to be this way, and, and, and we need to continue to rise to the moment um, and, and, not, and not encourage a kind of silencing and policing, but to engage with our full intellect and our full 
capacity of emotional, empathetic, brilliant people in furthering the discourse through our beings and our minds. So I, I, I think that she, she would have a lot to say about, about this moment, um, especially in, in, the, in the classroom and on these campuses. It's an unpopular conversation. I keep having it. People keep telling me, I'm going to cut things out because you could be canceled. I mean, I have a lot to say. But I, she, would, she would, you know, we cannot afraid of, be afraid of being canceled at this point. You know, there's too much to lose. I totally agree with everything Rebecca said, but I was thinking something differently initially when you asked the conversation. I think we are so fractured and in operating in individual silos that under this immense attack, we have not yet become organized even to defend ourselves, more or less get back on the offensive. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to figure out what, what, what that may look like in this, in this type of cipher and conversation with the work that has come because this is not a new um, obstacle. These obstacles have always existed in American life. And I think that's a lot of what I was trying to do in, in A Bound Woman, is think about the black women strategists and intellectuals that came before and how they resisted times like this. That in, when I was writing the book, I thought we were at our worst. Mm -hmm. Right? So. I'm thinking a lot about Bell's work, but I'm also questioning where are the allies? Where are the warriors? What is important to my allies? What are our goals? And how are we moving forward in this grip around democracy today? How, how are we doing it? And where are the strategies? And where are the strategies? Strongly about when 
um, she similarly was um, censored uh, a few months ago by reactionaries. And what really disturbs me about that is that her perspective is one that we really need to even begin to honestly address issues of race, you know, where she famously describes it in that interview with Charlie Rose as a neurosis that, you know, people insistently misunderstand. And so the very people who we, we need to be thinking with are the ones who, in some cases, are just so deliberately marginalized within the conversation. And yes, there should be outrage. Yes, there should be mobilization. I think where are we if we're in a culture where people feel okay actually to uh, approach, say, the first black, um, um, first, I mean, the first black vice president in this nation, Kamala Harris, to literally refer to her as a Jezebel or to dare to use phrases like Joe and the Ho, mm -hmm. and we don't have collective outrage, I do take seriously mm -hmm. um, First Lady Michelle Obama's um, phrasing that you know when they go low, we go high. But sometimes I wonder if that's even enough. You know, when I look at you know those casual childhood playground phrases like "well, sticks and stones." Um, may break your bones, but names will never hurt you. I look at that um, Blackness USA, Chelsea, you know, mm -hmm. and the way in which she was so vehemently just uh, discussed, and that hurt her. It really hurt her, mm -hmm. and possibly ultimately killed her. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's a lot that we can do and should do to um, concertedly address this very repressive and toxic culture that threatens to set us back, you know, a half century or more. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to add one more thing that, about her hair. I, for me, the most offensive was putting her face on a milk carton and declaring it was. Mm. And what we saw about Meghan Markle over in England, you know, mm. the, 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 it's too, it's back, it's back to, to uh, National um, National Association of Colored Women who mm -hmm. had to stand up to a racist journalist who mm -hmm. called black women, um, what do you call those, like the, 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 the prostitutes and mm -hmm. liars, um, and, and an entire organizational structure rose up to call that a lie. Mm -hmm. um, defending our name, black women created or an organization with um, tendrils, mm -hmm. right? Th that was called into being because of the public disrespect. But mm -hmm. if we're using our, our bell hooks lens, right, to actually analyze the problem, she would say that all of this aggression is proof that we have the solutions and the power. Mm -hmm. Right? That, that, that was the type of subversive way that she kind of, not subversive, but the, the kind of um, reading the dark matter in the room is mm -hmm. what Bell's intellectual fortitude was like. And I think mm -hmm. that's something that she would say. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think she would say in response to what you, what you raised about where are our allies and how do we organize, one of the things she would she would refer to, which is something that I feel very is very true. It's not a, it's it's not rocket science, but but you know when we think about how we get our words out, you know how we, when we how do we connect with our people, our allies, how do we find each other? When we think about as as writers and artists, and we think about the gatekeepers and how you know the big five publishing houses are not and never were really enthusiastic about publishing. Bell until much later, I think about the small presses, you know, I think about the ways in which the internet, while it is so problematic in so many ways, does create a forum and a way for us to connect. Um, I think about my own work, Black Cool, which I think is one of the most important books for me and, and definitely deeply influenced by Bell and, and one of her pieces is in it. And right now I'm doing a second volume. You know, I took that book out to everybody. Nobody wanted it other than, you know, a very small press. And you know that those are you know you find your people where they are, 
and, and, and I'm so grateful for those small presses that are out there supporting us continually. I think she would, she would speak to that, you know, to, to really appreciate um, the intimate, the small, and the power of that, and to understand that that grows. And I think she would respond to, 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 to Michelle Obama and the idea that we should, you know, when they go low, we go high. I mean, I think that's obviously, you know, Belle would, would find the spiritual elevation to that and the, and the evolutionary idea to that and the dignity. And she would also say, that's respectability politics 101. And who does that serve, you know? And how has it served us? It has served us in terms of our humanity, yes. And there is something that is lost. And we need to really be aware of everything that we're saying when we say that. Because disrespectability politics are real too. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I think we can open it up to the audience at this point, because um, obviously we can just sit here and talk. I believe it's obvious um, mm -hmm. for the next 20 minutes. But hopefully there's been something mentioned, something raised, got a, you got a question um, in mind. I don't know if we have a microphone. You might just have to jump up and project your place. Which Bell was very good at. Yeah, diaphragm talking. If not right now, just do final thoughts, wrapping up, and while y'all get yourselves together, raise your hand. Somebody will give you a microphone, and we'll just be wrapping up while while that's happening. Um, we'll start with Rache, Damaris, Rebecca. Any final thoughts? Yes, um, just a few. I I very much. Um, view Bell Hooks as having been a premier public intellectual, even though I use that term very provisionally. I think a lot of what has been said already underscores that she um, blazed a trail and yet it still didn't necessarily reap all of the benefits that came thereafter from um, certain precedents that she established. And so much of what she did was unprecedented and truly admirable. I think that she also um, popularized public scholarship approaches in ways that, in retrospect, have been far more democratized in the academy and that we can learn from and appreciate. One thing that I've always admired about her is that in so many ways she invented the genre in which she writes. One of the things that I um, would say like years ago in terms of trying to come to voice about Bell Hooks's um, profound intellectual impact and the importance of her writing is that if I encountered a person who had been away, um, Rip Van Winkle style, and if I could give that person just one person to read, who would that be? And Bell Hooks was always the person I would, you know, um, suggest uh, in my own little uh, scenario because I, I felt that if that person immersed uh, themselves in the reading of her books, then they could really catch up because her, her work covered just so much ground. Um, and so her body of books um, covers so many important uh, topics that I think it's really an indispensable uh, toolbox for thinking with, including about topics such as po popular culture. Um, I think that you know she's definitely been uh, a, a, a path-breaking uh, intellectual and raising um, questions and um, observations about black girlhood as well as black art, um, black popular culture. So across the board, um, she's been very, very innovative, consistently innovative. When I was a, a, an assistant professor in California, just starting out, after a busy week, one thing that I would enjoy doing uh, would be to go to my computer on Friday evenings and I would go to that site for frontless books, um, which was briefly um, a, a service that one could order from in North Carolina. And I would love the descriptions. I ordered from them actually maybe once or twice, but I would just read on that website. And another form of reading that I would do was to go to the Shambhala Sun site and read essays by Bell Hooks. And these were very different kinds of essays, even from any that seemed to be available in other places. It was where I heard her voice 
I heard a very different uh, Bell Hooks voice in some ways, and I, I, I was just so enriched by reading those essays, and I savored them, and in some cases recommended them to other people. Um, Bell Hooks is timeless, uh, she's unforgettable, and I salute her legacy, and I'm so thankful that I have had her influence on my own life. It was that was a place where we met in, in, in that space of understanding how Buddhist practice could inform our mental health and well-being and support us as we were being the warriors that we were, um, that she was definitely embodying and that I was aspiring to embody. And, and I think that's a space that doesn't get talked about very much. And it's, and it's a space that I hope many people who seek her and find her can 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 enter into because it's a it's a powerful tool, um, technology as people are, are saying that can be used to to clear one's mind and settle one in a sense of peace irrespective of what's going on around you. So I'm really I for, I, I I'm sorry that I forgot to bring in Buddhism because it was such a big part of her life, um, and I. You know, I think we, we all are so grateful for her and love her and, and everything that has already been said. I think I, I, I want to just give a, a small example of how I learned from her. Um, you know, I, I think for the first 20 years, and even still today, of giving talks on college campuses, every, all the different talks, I started every single talk with an example from Bell, and it was this. I, I would get up and say, um, you know, this, I'm standing behind the patriarchal pulpit, as, as Bell would say when I would go up to the podium. This is the phallic shield, and it was designed to, to, to protect the interlocutor between God, the person up high, and the people coming to get the wisdom. Right? So that every, all of you, I would say to people in the audience, and I'm saying now, all of you are supposed to be thought of as, as lesser than, than me, the person at the podium, and especially, and I'm lesser than the, the big man over there. And, and then I would say, and you know what Belle taught me? She taught me to come out from behind the patriarchal pulpit and to stand with you and to honor that we all have the knowledge and that I'm here to learn from you as much as you are here to learn from me and that there does not need to be an interlocutor because we are all embodying the spirit. And, and to me, that, in a nutshell, <laughs> was, was her gift. It was the decolonization of our intellect, the decolonization of our true knowledge and our ability to commune together um, and to find the value in one another as opposed to looking for an interlocutor to bestow upon us the right to be who we are. Thank you. I totally agree with that. I'm in between the two minds still, but um, the first one, the first thing I'm thinking about now is um, the legacies of Bell Hooks um, exceeding, you know, how we view her in this professional space. Um, in terms of higher education and what does it mean to be like, you know, this other type of secular, spiritual wisdom and guide, how, how do her, her plain text that we have right now act as a type of scroll and a guide for living better futures? But then also, that, that, that might be the, the how me. The low me is like, what would Belle do if she was in a celebrity death match with a single senator from Kentucky? <laughs> like, you know, like, um, 
you know, like just, just playing with those boundaries and thinking about Bell returning to Kentucky in this peculiar time and space and challenging everything that the political policies might be so loud about. And then, you know, kind of having a conversation with myself and on the page that, that you know, that old saying that a, that a prophet can never be recognized in their own town. I mean, you, you have divine wisdom walking all around you, yet you don't ask anybody. Right? And so those are, I'm thinking about legacy beyond the intellectual, right? What does the dynamic um, life of Bell look like in, in legacy form? I, I'm not sure what it is yet. So what's that? Yeah, that's what's that. We still don't play some of those still sign. Well, we can, I think we're about done. You don't have to ask a question. We don't have any questions. Up, <gasps> up, no? oh, oh, the ashamed people. So there's one there and one here, so we'll start. to that I feel I feel very similarly you know this idea of teaching with love and um, and also teaching with the intention of helping my students and my readers to 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 rewrite their stories in ways that are that are that are powerful for them to go back into the dark the dark space and find the light that is there and and to help them understand that they can do that that they are wired to hold on to stories that are keeping them in spaces that are not healthy, and that they have the power to rewrite themselves into being in a different way. And that's definitely something that, that was Bell's work and what she, what she gave, and I feel very much called to do that work and to hold people it with love and to teach with love and to teach with, with spirit, with, with a sense of, um, this is a practice, you know, Belle talked a lot about going into her writing as going into a sacred space, a holy space, 
And, and that to me is something that I always want to invite my students and, 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 the, and the people that I touch and move with to remember that this is a space that, that is healing if you can enter in. Yes. Right, I'm still happy to share this time with you.